Have you ever wanted to play as a recovering Saruman you? voiced by Colonel Campbell? I begin to think the cause of this destruction cannot be other than myself. Sacrifice follows the story of Name Your Own Wizard Eldred, or Smeals in my case, telling the game's events to his seer friend Mithras. Shockingly, yes, it turns out that summoning a design. demon by the name of Marduk wasn't the best idea in fighting off the armies of your enemies, as Marduk I decided to do one to be better by destroying the world of Jira while he's at it. Due to this, our protagonist Eldred decides to leg it to the world of Sacrifice. There, he prays to offer his services as a wizard to the five gods, Charnel, a mad lad of slaughter, Pyro, a boss nass looking fireboy, Stratos, a goofy looking balloon, Persephone, who's just some dryad, and what only can be Earthworm Jim's brother, James. Good to see they're not taking themselves too seriously. In any case, they're all busy arguing with one another, and I'm more than happy to accept the services of some bloke able to cast Chain Lightning. From there, you get used by whichever god or gods you choose to work for, as they strive to make themselves the dominant power of sacrifice, all the while looking for the demon Marduk, otherwise known as Asher, in search of payback. Made by Shiny Entertainment in 2000 and published by Interplay Entertainment, Sacrifice is from a time back when developers were still figuring out what works and weren't afraid of trying out new ideas. It's a bit unconventional in the way of real-time strategy games, wherein there aren't really any standard resources to collect, instead it revolves around mana to cast spells and souls to recruit new units. I'll try to keep the basic premise concise, since it can otherwise get a bit complicated. TLDR, you gain mana when near a mana fount, which you can build mana lifts atop of, that will then channel to any mana whores you summon to let you regen while out and about. Souls, on the other hand, come in two flavors, red and blue. They drop from falling creatures, blue being allied monsters that you can freely pick up by walking over and spend on summoning more creatures to fight for you. Meanwhile, red are the enemies that you can convert by casting a spell and getting one of these little sack doctors to come suck it up with a giant syringe. I love the little dance that they do, they're just so happy. The total souls you have available is tallied up at the top right alongside your wizard's health and mana bars. Different tiers of creature require a different amount of souls, typically being more expensive the more powerful they are. Then it comes down to commanding these little gits to go beat up the enemy while you support them using spells and doing generally wizardy things to clap the enemy's cheeks. Death is in the end, however. Instead, wizards will become a feral and chill out for a while until they manage to come back by vibing near any available mana source. The only way to ensure a wizard stays dead is to desecrate their altar by casting a spell on one of your goons and then killing them a final time so they stay down. Conceptually, it works rather well, perhaps better than it ought to, really with its rock-paper-scissors mentality when it comes to the units. Melee trumps ranged, beats flying, beats melee. The only major hurdle to accurately controlling units would have to be the UI. Unless you've dedicated all the formations to memory, you'll be stuck using the radial menu to select between them. They don't seem to remember the last formation they were issued either, so telling them to attack something, then go back to guarding you to follow you around will usually end up setting them in the default line formation. As a result, it can get a little tiresome keeping track and ensuring melee are up front and ranged units are tagging along behind you. I do appreciate the way that Eldred verbally acknowledges and issues command to his units though, that's a really nice touch. Move! You are group one. Yeah. You are group two. Plus, it does feel pretty good to watch your wizard running around with a doomstack of dozens of murder monsters. When it comes to the AI, the pathfinding is good enough that they'll usually try to keep in formation, although I did have mana whores blocking me in and refusing to get out of the way sometimes. Also, it's worth mentioning that the camera is stuck at a specific height, which means you'll constantly be battling it as you try to click around large units or flyers following you around. Whenever you stop and start moving again, it also pans your camera back behind Eldred, so you'll be constantly adjusting it to try and keep a consistent line of sight. Likewise, when things start to get really hectic and a lot of units are slapping each other around, it can be nearly impossible to figure out who you're targeting. I've lost count of how many times I've clicked on my own creatures by mistake when trying to aim spells. This ranges from being a little frustrating to being pretty devastating when dealing with the late game spells that have super long cast times and even longer cooldown periods, as they can end up killing your own entire army by mistake because of how cluttered the HUD becomes. Granted, you can use the minimap if you're trying to target enemy wizards or specific spots of the terrain, but good luck if you're aiming for anything else. 
The fixed camera height also poses a problem when tackling hills too, since it'll have you facing the ground or staring up at the sky more often than not, making it practically impossible to manually aim or even see where you're being attacked from when it comes to dealing with slopes. Sacrifice features asymmetrical combat with unique units and spells alike depending on which of the five gods you choose to work for. You can even mix and match having more spells of other pantheons stapled into your spell books by choosing to work for another on subsequent missions. However, they do eventually call you out and have you more or less be locked into one side or another about halfway through the campaign, so you're eventually going to have to pick favorites. The selection of creatures you can summon are thematically fitting towards the domain of their respective god, with James having slow but durable rock creatures. Stratos has fragile but quick units that kind of suck ass outside of a few select choices. And Charnel's Undead Army lacks innate regeneration, instead healing itself through lifesteal. Some are objectively better than others though, and when you designate a creature to be a guardian to a structure, it gives them a huge amount of regeneration. As a result, Hellmouths can be nigh impossible to kill without using instant death spells or having a huge army wailing on them for ages. Getting close to silverbacks can also be frustrating as they'll end up stunlocking you by freezing you in a block of ice over and over, interrupting all of your spells until you die. No matter their level of usefulness, pretty much all of the monster's designs are very unique and distinct though, but readability can suffer a bit when there's hordes of small units all lumped together. Persephone's rangers and druids look more or less the same to me, since they're just some variation of dude. But hey, at least they get the Gonarch from Half-Life. The asymmetrical combat extends to the spells too, with most of them being similar to their counterparts but having slight differences. With lightning being accurate in a straight line but being easily defeated by so much as a small hill, while the rock spell homes in on its target but usually ends up hitting my own flying units instead. The spells can differentiate substantially once you get into the higher end though, with James having the funniest spell in the game by far. Following his brother's example, Bovine Intervention launches a cow into the air that one-shots any summoned creature and instantly converts its souls to your side. The effects hold up pretty well, and some are actually quite impressive looking, like the ground visibly deforming before giving way when using Erupt, setting yourself and enemies alike flying around in a tornado, or saying screw that to your enemy's entire army and sending these guardians to the Shadow Realm with James's Boar spell. <laughs> Thankfully, the tutorials are long and in-depth enough to give you a clear understanding of how to play, since it can otherwise be a bit daunting at first figuring everything out. There's a lot of buttons here. I only managed to finish one and a half of them, however, since partway through the second tutorial it bugged out and I couldn't complete it. No matter what I did, the game wouldn't recognize that I selected all of my rangers like it was telling me to, so I tried to brute force it by advancing to the next part of the map to skip ahead, but that just resulted in me being teleported back to the beginning of the level. Well, I guess I'm ready. The main campaign itself consists of the five gods offering you different missions that you can choose from, having you complete nine of them in sequence before ultimately carrying on to the final confrontation with Marduk. Having a total of 45 missions to choose from, there's a lot of replay value to be had here, with the ability to witness events from different sides depending on what path you take. A nice feature of working for different gods is also that it augments your spellbook so you have a mixed roster of summons, like picking up a couple of Pyro's abilities while mainly working for Charnel, so I ended up having two flavors of the same kind of ranged gnome unit more or less. Going through different playthroughs can be pretty interesting as the story stays roughly the same but with small differences as alliances form and change as you advance through the levels. Speaking of the levels, each zone of sacrifice reflects the domain and attributes of the respective deities, like Elysium having lots of greenery in Persephone's forests. Meanwhile, Charnel is a hellscape with fleshy terrain and insects everywhere, and James having canyons and dirt and not much else. For such a small development team, and given the time of release, the maps look pretty good as a whole and match with the rest of the game's aesthetics, being just floating landmasses in a heavenly void. Some can be pretty huge too, taking multiple minutes to run across. It is worth mentioning that the difficulty for missions can vary pretty wildly though, which I found out firsthand when I made the mistake of following Stratos on my first playthrough. I thought this silly balloony boy would be a fun time since he's so goofy looking, but it turns out that he's no joke and actually has the hardest missions in the game by far. 
At first, I figured it was just me getting used to the controls, but I quickly learned after getting curb stomped into the ground and restarting the first few missions a bunch of times that, no, most of his units are just kind of bad and he gets some very long difficult missions with incredibly tough matchups against very tanky enemies that he just pales in comparison to. The last couple of levels took several hours each, and the final mission was a 3-4 hour slog that has to be one of the most tedious and frustrating experiences I've ever had in an RTS game. It doesn't help that I learned you can carry through legendary units that survive during the main missions if they don't die, so I didn't have any strong backup upon reaching the endgame. RIP. Conversely, the final mission took about half an hour at most when playing through again on James, who has to be the easiest in comparison given just how durable his units are and how many instant death spells you have to deal with any problematic enemies. The difference in difficulty between missions can be wildly inconsistent and come without warning. Still, for the most part, they were fun to play through and restarts became a lot less common once I learned the controls and set my own custom bindings for spells. Since besides universal stuff like making mana lifts, summoning mana whores, and setting unit formations, there's none bound by default. I would take the time to mention the multiplayer, but it crashed upon the first time I booted it up, then as expected it turned out to be dead anyway when I got it working. So, moving on. The graphics, while quite outdated by now, were rather good for their time, and the aesthetics as a whole are still great to look at even today. As mentioned, the design and layout of levels all reflect their respective gods and the deities themselves are all quite distinct and memorable. The units are likewise very creative, like the Sack Doctors being little round guys with faces on their torsos, and what looks like to be heads at a glance actually turning out to be some hat that they're wearing. Meanwhile, the Storm Giants straight up look like something taken out of Quake. Eldred himself also looks pretty good, as do a lot of the different wizards you encounter. Overall, I'd say Sacrifice has a very weird but distinct look to it that's a little on the cartoony side. To be fair, that's probably to offset how morbid it can be when you really think about the whole sacrificing someone's soul to summon an army of horrifying monsters. The animations shown of each god while speaking are pretty simple loops, but are a nice touch at showing their personalities, and they're also voiced really well. It does not matter if what the worm says is true. No Asher can threaten Pyro once the Pyrodralic Dynamo is completed. To activate it, we will need more slaves, but <laughs> I think James just volunteered to provide them. The voice acting as a whole is pretty stellar, and it actually shares a lot of the same cast as the Legacy of Kane, funnily enough. As for the music, the main menu sounds very eerie, and the five battle tracks are enjoyable enough and set the tone, but they can get a little repetitive after a while, since they're only about 90 seconds long each. There's only about half an hour of music total, but you'll be missing out most of it anyway, since half of it is locked behind very specific circumstances. I also noticed that it would sometimes cut out rather abruptly during set pieces. Having trouble finding me? I do enjoy the music and sounds that play while the Sack Doctors are performing the ritual to sacrifice souls to the altar, since they made it sound as creepy as having your entire being changed at its very core ought to be. Sacrifice doesn't take itself too seriously though, and there are some comedic sound effects thrown in on occasion during the sillier moments, like a slapstick fight against a dragon inside of a cave. The creatures and units themselves sound pretty good and have a mix of different personalities or strange noises depending on what you're selecting. Although you will be hearing the same joke a whole lot given how few sound bites they get. Sometimes when bigger fights break out, it can also kind of just devolve into a cacophony of noise after a while. The biggest letdown, by far and away, when it comes to the sound design has to be your advisor, Sizzix. All of your mana whores have been slaughtered. That spell is not ready. That spell is not ready. This owl familiar follows you around and it'll be chaining up all the invalid targets and misclicks you'll be doing, which is a lot thanks to the camera controls, so you'll be hearing this pretty much non-stop. It honestly wouldn't be that bad if it had a cooldown, but no, it's just constant. You can switch it off in the options, but then you'll miss out on important information like enemies attacking your buildings or approaching your altar. I guess you'll have to decide whether that's the sacrifice you're willing to make. All of that said, I still think Sacrifice is a very interesting and ultimately fun game in a mix of genres you don't often see, even if that's usually for good reason. 
Here it works for the most part, with only a few shortcomings stemming from the wonky UI and some questionable level designs that had me wondering what the designers were thinking. The score is a little scarce, but enjoyable to listen to, and the gameplay itself was engaging enough to see me through multiple playthroughs. The rock-paper-scissors nature of the combat felt a little sketchy at times, but usually held up, and it's just a shame that Sacrifice undersold at release, since I would have loved to see a sequel with some balance changes and adjustments to the UI. The setting and tone are wonderfully executed, and it's a rare case of a niche cross of genres working out and being genuinely fun to play through. I picked up my copy of Sacrifice for dirt cheap off of Steam and can fully recommend giving it a try. Just be wary of weather balloons trying to sweet talk you.